Welcome to Psychology Matters. I'm your host, Sarah Carpey, and today I have with me Rebecca McFarlane, and she's here to talk with us about ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Tell me more about the ACEs study and how it got started. ACEs study happened back in the 1990s, uh, late 1990s at Kaiser Permanente, which most people know is a pretty well-known um, insurance company, mm -hmm. and they wanted to find out what was the root cause of some of the big things, big health issues that we're facing in this country. So they uh, studied 17,000 people in San Diego. Most of them were white, middle class, college ed educated people, and they looked into their history of the things that had happened to them in their childhoods um, and used that to look at the correlation between the number of things that might have happened to them that traumatized them as children mm. um, and their health outcomes later in life. And what they found surprised them greatly because they, they didn't realize that the correlation was going to be quite so significant. Um, so among this group of people, most of them had had at least one adverse childhood experience in their life. What kind of things were they looking at? What, what are adverse childhood experiences, Rebecca? Well, Quite honestly, there anything that can happen that can traumatize or create toxic stress, which we'll talk about in a minute, but anything that can create stress in a child's life that lasts longer than it should. Mm -hmm. But for this study, they studied 10 different things. They studied five types of abuse, mm -hmm. so sexual abuse, physical abuse and neglect, um, emotional and, and physical neglect, um, but they also studied five different household dysfunctional, um, different things like uh, divorce happening in the family, mm -hmm. Um, whether or not a parent was incarcerated, um, a mother maybe experiencing some domestic abuse, um, things like a, a parent having a chronic illness. Um, but now we have more than 10 ACEs that we look at. We do. We have uh, many more things that can, then can cause trauma in a childhood. Like what? So, for example, poverty oh, is a big yes, one. Yes, a big impact on kids. Yes. And, and later in adults. Later in adults, exactly. exactly. So, uh, and we know that when parents are dealing with stress, kids are dealing with stress. Mm -hmm. So the idea that a child, even an infant, is, is too young to remember the difficulties that are going on in a home. Mm -hmm. um, this study has time and time again been replicated and has shown that it, it isn't so, that, that kids even before they're born mm -hmm. in the womb, um, when their parents are experiencing stress like that, and stress that doesn't go away, it really does impact on their health. Um, both psychological and physical health throughout their entire lives. Wow. So um, what is the, what's the latest on about, uh, latest going on with ACEs? What do we know about it today that may be different than the initial study? Well, what we know, what we know today is that it, it, is, it is absolutely a fact now. It is mm -hmm. a scientific fact that ACEs and adverse childhood experiences have a really big impact on the health of our country. I mean, it's been studied for it's such studied a long for time. so long and replicated over and over again in different populations, in different scenarios, um, and the same findings come back again and again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So although, you know, we've been facing a lot of um, public health outcries around obesity, around diabetes, around heart disease, these sorts of big, the sort of top 10 um, things that, that we worry about in health, mm -hmm. physical health, have direct root causes um, going back to childhood trauma. Sure. So we know that um, of the 10 original adverse childhood experiences, um, if people have experienced four or more before they're 18 years old, they have a much, um, much decreased lifespan. Mm. They're less likely to graduate from college. They're um, much, much more likely to struggle with substance abuse and mental health issues and things mm. like that. They're more so, likely to, yes. Much more. And so, um, but that's not to say everyone who's experienced childhood trauma will of course. experience those things later, right? Right, because we, we also know that there are a lot of things that we can put in place that um, can act as protective factors for young people. Sure. So although all of us experience stress at times in life, we all go through difficult periods, and um, it's very difficult for, in a family not to have some stress. Sure. Um, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, if a child has something to buffer it, mm -hmm. um, if they have a caring adult, if they have a secure environment, um, these sort of protective factors are really, really critical mm -hmm. for whether or not those adverse experiences are going to have an impact on their life. Sure. So that early trauma and those risk factors that you were mentioning earlier, those ACEs, um, 
how do they affect someone's life, like mm -hmm. for their mental health and their physical health? Mm -hmm. What kind of things are we looking at um, as far as their teen years and their adulthood? What kind of things can we look for, say, in their mental health? What kind of um, changes can we expect in their mental health if so, they've experienced <clears throat> a lot of um, adverse childhood experiences? If, if a young person has had more than four mm -hmm. adverse experiences before they're 18, um, their adolescence and their early adulthood, is it's very obvious that they will have um, more likelihood of having difficulty in school. Mm -hmm. They're less likely to graduate high school. They're more likely to become pregnant mm -hmm. and have teenage pregnancy. They're more likely to um, engage in risky behaviors because what has happened is those traumatic events have actually changed their brain. Mm -hmm. And so they're even more likely to take risks and to engage in things like substance abuse mm -hmm. um, simply to counteract the imbalance that's happened in their brains because the trauma has changed the way their brain developed. Mm -hmm. So um, just to st st statistically, it's 1,200% um, more likely to complete suicide, oh, for example. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, they're 400 times more likely to develop chronic bronchitis mm -hmm. and diseases and, and that sort of thing. Um, someone with six or more adverse experiences, their lifespan is actually reduced by 20 years. Um, so these different correlations and, and the science behind this um, is shocking when you first hear mm -hmm. it, um, but it changes a lot of the, um, the way we think about troubled youth um, and sure. whether or not we're looking at the right things. Um, this isn't, when we have youth who are you know, engaging in risky behaviors and um, going out and breaking rules and, and being rebellious. That's part of being an adolescent, sure. Um, but when it becomes, um, when it becomes significantly uh, impairing their mental health, when they are not able to um, participate in school or have satisfying relationships and all those things that we look at in terms of mental health, um, that's when we, we can say, well, the trauma that this young person has experienced, has experienced is the, the thing we need to heal. It's less about then um, punishment and behavior changes. Um, all those, those things can be supportive in the recovery of um, trauma. Uh, what we really have to think about is how do we heal not just the child, but the entire family. The entire family, that's what's so important yes. because we know probably the entire family has been involved mm -hmm. um, in a lot of cases. So. It, it gets back to figuring out what's happened to you rather than what's wrong with you, that's right? Because that's question. the key, really, a lot of times. It's like, yeah. you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you acting like this? Uh -huh. And it's back to what have you been through, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. And mm -hmm. that's that's the, the thing that we really have to consider. And um, we're moving more and more towards helping teachers and pastors and coaches and parents and grandparents understand that, um, the reason that we're seeing more and more kids struggle with their mental health and with their physical health, frankly, is not necessarily because of social media or because people are on their Xbox too much. A lot of it has to do with what is happening to our children, mm -hmm. not necessarily just because society is changing. And so it could be something that happened years ago. We know a lot it of could, times that it, it could be, be something that happened in the womb. Mm -hmm. um, we know that, when, that mothers who are experiencing um, domestic uh, violence who have been going through homelessness and poverty while pregnant, um, those children still have the effects of um, adverse childhood experiences in their brain development even before they're born. So basically that toxic stress is just being communicated through that kid physically. It and is, it and, it, on, and it really comes down to brain science. Mm -hmm. This is not, this is less about um, behaviors and learned mm -hmm. patterns. It's very much about brain science. Mm -hmm. And when we think about what parts of the brain develop during certain parts of our development, mm -hmm. of our physical development, um, there are times in our lives where our brains are very plas plastic and can absorb a lot more information, mm -hmm. but they also can absorb a lot of the trauma that goes on. So that zero to three um, period is critical, mm -hmm. um, but we have another time and our brains are really um, developing and that's right at the beginning of adolescence, that 13 to 15 years old. Um, during those two periods of our development, um, the trauma that happens can impact on us a lot more significantly than if they'd happened at other times. So that's often why we, we have issues when parents are divorced. Mm. 
It's just a common thing these days. I think it's more than 51% now wow. of marriages end in divorce. Um, it will affect a seven-year-old very differently than it will a 14-year-old. Mm. And sometimes I think that parents forget that those 14-year-olds, their brains are developing at a very fast pace, mm -hmm. and they need certain things at that age. And instead of um, being careful about that, we think, well, they're older. They'll be okay. Sure. We'll mm -hmm. tend to the younger. And, and they need help, too. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's mm -hmm. not that we ignore the mm -hmm. seven-year-old, but their brains um, are in a different different stage of development mm -hmm. um, so it really does it really does matter that we have a very informed um, public who understands what is going on with your child's brain um, what is the impact of the things that they're experiencing and how do we make sure they're protected and there are some protective factors around there well yes yeah, certainly and you throw um, prepubescence into all of right. that and all the hormones and everything else that's going yes. on it just complicates matters all that much exactly. and it's not just the trauma that they might be experiencing themselves it may be witnessing um, trauma as Absolutely. well mm -hmm. we talk about things like natural event natural mm -hmm. disasters um, you know fire flood tornadoes these are traumas as well mm -hmm. um, so anything that can um, create stress that doesn't go away quickly. So we're not talking necessarily about what we call kind of positive stress, which mm -hmm. is stress you have to go through in order for you to develop certain problem-solving skills. Mm -hmm. um, starting a new school, mm -hmm. going, having to, to have a, a difficult test, or mm -hmm. um, making new friends. Those sorts of things are very um, positive for development. They mm -hmm. teach kids lots of really good things. Albeit stressful. It's stressful in the moment, and there may be kind of stress. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a positive. It's a more positive stress rather than the toxic that you're right. referring to. Or, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. The middle kind of stress, though, is when something big happens in someone's life. Mm -hmm. So maybe the death of a grandparent or mm -hmm. a pet, um, where it's really very difficult to get through. It may take a little while. Um, for, for young people to get through that, mm -hmm. but they tend to bounce back. Children are very resilient in, in that sort of situation. Mm -hmm. When we talk about toxic stress, that's where we are talking about adverse childhood experiences. Sure. So it's that kind of stress that is a long period of time mm -hmm. um, where it's very much something that child has no control over, mm -hmm. um, and it tends to never go away. Mm. So the level of cortisol in their in their blood, the, the way their brain reacts, um, the way they interact with other people changes mm -hmm. um, because that stress lasts for, for months, if not years. Sure. And sometimes that sense of helplessness and hopelessness is really hard for kids to deal with. Absolutely, mm -hmm. especially when they really, their brains haven't developed enough to mm -hmm. know what's going on or, or even to think about the fact that it might get better. Sure. If their whole lives has felt this way, right. chaos and, and, and worry about mom or dad, um, it's really difficult for them to see any other future. I like that you mentioned um, having that sense of hope and, mm -hmm. and that caring adult and how important that can be because mm -hmm. somebody needs to help that child realize that um, having a positive outcome or that, that sense of hope that things will be okay is so important and connecting with an adult can make all the difference in the world in a child's life. Can you talk more about that? Sure. Um, that's one of the best messages that came out of all of this, mm -hmm. come out of all this work, um, is that we know that um, most youth development models show that one adult, one caring adult can make all the difference for a young person. And the ACEs work has, has reinforced that and doubled it probably. Uh, we know that what really makes a young person resilient is having an adult caring, stable, healthy adult mm -hmm. who can help keep them kind of resilient, help them bounce back help them um, get through that stress, mm -hmm. even the toxic stress. That's the thing that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. So when I work with people and do classes with people on ACEs or on mental health, um, we often ask them, who is your caring adult? Mm -hmm. And depending on the audience, it's starkly obvious that that has made a difference for people. Mm -hmm. When we go into uh, groups that are in recovery from substance abuse, for example, um, we'll have 30 people in the room and maybe two of them will, can remember a caring adult. That's Whereas really... you go into a group of teachers or professionals that have, you know, got stable lives and, and they will say, yes, they had some difficult times growing up, but they had a caring adult and that made that that is the differentiator. Makes all the difference. All the difference. Mm -hmm. But that's a good message for us too, to know that um, no matter who you are and, and what your relationship is with a child, um, by connecting with them, by um, being a good caring adult 
and just being there, I always say, just keep showing up. Mm. Even if that young person is adamant they don't want you next to them, <laughs> which they sometimes are. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just a show up thing. Mm -hmm, um, keep mm -hmm. showing up um, because that stability and that, that ability to show them that they matter mm. um, is the thing that makes the biggest difference. Right. I think there's some consistency there that's important. And, and to say, you know, you might not want to talk to me today, but I'm here for you, yeah. you know. And, um, or if it's not me you want to talk to, then, you know, find somebody else. So just yeah. to um, put that out there, I think is so yeah. important. It, it can't be about us, right? So no. we have to make mm -hmm. sure that they're connected to someone. Mm -hmm. um, and who that someone is is going to change throughout their lives. So we know there's a period of time during adolescence where mom and dad are not the people they're going to want to be <laughs> hanging out with so much. Um, so true. And it's great for them to have good, strong friendships mm -hmm. and relationships that are developing, but they need to have a caring adult too. Mm -hmm. Um, that they, they know they can go to and that they can trust and who can be that stable, caring person in their lives. So true. Now, if somebody wanted to find out more about the Kaiser Permanente study and mm -hmm. more about ACEs, how, where could they go? Is, are there websites you can find? I mean, I know you can just Google it, but how do I know I'm going and finding <laughs> yeah. some good information about it? Well, the good news is here in Tennessee, um, Tennessee is actually leading, um, leading the pack with some of this work. So oh, we have wonderful. a lot of really good data. We've had a wonderful support from Governor, Governor Haslam during mm -hmm. his um, tenure as the governor, and he has um, made sure that there are reoccurring funds now in the, in the state budget for this work. Great. So um, ACES Tennessee is a great place to go. Um, there's also a website called Building Strong Brains. Mm. Um, Building Strong Brains is a training that has been developed by the state through the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth. Mm -hmm. And um, they have trained 800 or so um, trainers. Um, and just thousands of people now have gone through Building Strong Brains and how to deal with ACEs, including teachers and schools and, and general public. So um, the best way really here in Tennessee is, is to go and, and find out more about Building Strong Brains and mm -hmm. to get yourself into a class. They're all for free, mm -hmm. um, and they're about three hours, um, but they're a fantastic way to learn more about this and, and to talk to your community. Um, these community trainings are a great way for a community to come together and think about how do we address this issue um, wider than just family by family. So if I, you know, if I suspect that I know a youth or know someone who may have experienced a lot of um, adverse childhood um, experiences, how, how can mm -hmm. I help them or what can I do to support them? Well, number one is just to be that, again, just be someone who they can connect with. Mm -hmm. um, but there are lots of policies and things in, in place that can help too. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest things that we know makes a difference for families who are experiencing or likely to experience um, adverse childhood experiences is um, home visiting and um, in-home therapy and things like that where we have a really a two-generational approach mm -hmm. um, to dealing with um, the impact that ACEs has. We know that we can't heal children if we don't heal families. Mm -hmm. um, so what you can do is really be really open about, um, one, that this is nobody's fault. There's something about stigma around a lot of this that we have to be really participating and be very um, intentional about um, not participating in that stigma being, you know, um, being put out there. Um, the fact is that mental health and substance abuse is not a character flaw, mm -hmm. um, that it is not a failing, that it is not a lack of religion, and that it is not a lack of, of wanting to be well. Um, and as you said earlier, it's always about what happened to you and mm -hmm. not what's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. um, if we can change our mindset around the behaviors we see in young people, and also in people who perhaps, um, where it has been generational, where we have families who have generation after generation been, been struggling with adverse experience, adverse, adverse childhood experiences, um, we can't blame parents either. And I think that sometimes, especially in professional areas, um, there's always this cry, we just need better parent, parent training. Oh, well. I hear it over mm -hmm. and over. Mm -hmm. And the truth is what we need is parent healing. That's so less true. Less than training. A so. little more empathy towards the parents yeah. because we tend to want to blame them for everything that's wrong, you know, going yeah. on with the kids. And that's really tough because, you know, divorce happens mm -hmm. and, th you know, there's some things that just happen and it's no one's fault. It is no mm -hmm. one's fault. And it, and the nice thing about ACEs and the studies that we've seen is that um, 
although it's a correlation between these, these health outcomes that we, we want to um, reduce, nothing is for certain. It's not fate. Mm -hmm. um, there are always things that we can do to recover mm -hmm. from um, the effects of, of trauma and adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. So um, we talked a little bit about the brain science, which I think was really important. Um, tell me about um, some more of the statistics associated with it or um, a little bit about, um, you know, what, what we can do in our community. Okay. So the brain science is fascinating. Mm -hmm, I'm kind of mm -hmm. a brain geek. So oh, yeah, we could go on about that. We could talk another hour about mm -hmm. that, I'm sure. But the wonder, wondrous thing about the brain is that um, when we're born, we have synapses that start developing immediately. And um, they start out slowly, but by three months old, we are developing synapses a million a minute. Mm, that's incredible, and those, isn't it? It is. It's just amazing to think of that. A million synapses a minute that are forming in our little brains... Um, from everything that's happening around us. And that's why we say children are such sponges at that they age. They are. They really they are. They truly are. A million synapses. And that was a study done by Harvard um, Center for Childhood Development. So um, it's an amazing amount. So all those synapses that are firing, um, when we have a young person who is experiencing trauma or um, experiences like seeing having a mother incarcerated or having a mother that's that's or a father that is um, dealing with a chronic illness, the attachment cycle that is absolutely critical for human development gets disrupted. Mm. So, and because that attachment cycle gets disrupted, our brains, the way the synapses fire, actually change. And we have some great um, imagery of brains um, from different um, children that we can compare to say their brain has has literally changed mm -hmm. in terms of what areas are being are functional, what areas light up during certain things. Um, and we compare them um, to healthy children who, who haven't had those experiences. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's, really, um, it's really obvious that the area of the brain that controls fight, flight, or freeze is vastly um, overstimulated and overdeveloped and the prefrontal cortex and the area, other areas of the brain that really help regulate some of those impulses have not developed mm. in those children. So it, again, is, has, has shown that there is scientific evidence here that these um, traumatic events are very, very um, af affecting for, for young brains. Um, so what was the second part there? <laughs> well, just what can we do then? Right. I mean, now that mm -hmm. we know all this brain science, I mean, mm -hmm. how can we, um, you know, what do we do with that knowledge? What do we do with that? How, That's how the do big we, question. You know, What's next? <laughs> what do we do? How yes. can we make sure that we're um, having an impact in our community on helping these kids Absolutely. that have experienced this? So or the, even adults now that exactly. they're Exactly. Yeah, because adults going through these things are likely to have had those experiences mm -hmm. themselves, right? So... Um, the the um, thing that we're moving towards is something called trauma informed care. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and when we talk about trauma informed care, um, we are talking about ACEs. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what we're talking about. So we want to make sure that our school policies, that our our legislators are passing um, things uh, pieces of legislation that give funding to the right programs. Mm -hmm. We know that for every dollar that is put into things like home visits, and things that heal families saves us about nine dollars later on in care um, incarceration rates go down everything changes so we as a community as a state we really need to be talking to our legislators about the importance of trauma in mm -hmm. child children and if we really want to heal both the mental health issues that we have and are seeing increasing um, suicide rates are going up and up and up we know from the tennessee society Preve um, suicide prevention network last year that Suicide rates have gone up 65% in the last 10 years. Mm. Um, if we have any chance of dealing with that, it's going to take much more than the things that we've got in place. We've got to, we've got to start healing our society rather than just putting Band-Aids on things. So as a community, we have to, thought, have, to have those conversations about how our juvenile justice system, our, our practitioners in mental health and physical health, our teachers, our church leaders, are all embracing this idea of being trauma-informed so that we react to things in a very different way. 
Well, I hope you'll come back and talk more about trauma-informed care, Rebecca. Thanks for being with us today. You're so welcome. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Psychology Matters. I'm Sarah Carper, your host. Please check us out on Facebook and on Psychology Matters TV. You can see us on YouTube. Um, check out um, ACES. Rebecca mentioned some websites you can view, and we'll see you on another episode.